Imagine that a meteor, we'll imagine it looks something like this, is hurling towards the Earth, and in just a few days, it will hit the surface and wipe out humanity. Now imagine there's a room of scientists, and they've discovered that if we take enough people on one part of the Earth and ask them to jump at the same time, then that collective jump will be enough to move the Earth out of harm's way. Maybe that's not so hard to imagine right now. Now you could take the smartest mathematicians and physicists who could tell you exactly how many people you need and at what height they have to jump, but unless you can communicate that plan to the people who have to jump, then the science doesn't mean anything. That meteor is going to hit the Earth. Our environment faces so many meteors right now. A new pandemic, anthropogenic climate change, a biodiversity crisis. And we need everybody to jump. And that's really hard to do. The meteor my research focuses on is water quality in the Great Lakes. Now my family owns a farm in Southern California. So from a young age, I had a unique understanding of water as a resource. The California drought put immense strain on my family. But I grew up in Ohio and I remember thinking, well, at least here in the Midwest, we'll never run out of water. But then in 2014, 100,000 people were exposed to lead contaminated water. Then in Toledo, half a million residents had their drinking water turned off because of harmful algal blooms. And it became apparent that clean, safe water is never a guarantee. Access to water is what inspired me to study environmental policy and decision making, and it inspired me to pursue Great Lakes research. So what happened to Toledo in 2014? As I mentioned, Toledo residents lost their drinking water because of harmful algal blooms. And for those of you who don't live close to a lake shore, this is what that looks like. These algae are fed by fertilizer that we use on farms. Phosphorus, nitrogen, things we refer to as nutrients are placed on a field and are intended to stay on a field to create a soil environment ideal for production. But rainwater and gravity causes these nutrients to flow off a field and into our streams, rivers, and great lakes. Now remember that room of scientists I told you about earlier? The ones who could tell you how many people we needed and how high they had to jump? Well, we have those scientists. And they can tell us things like whether or not we're going to have a big bloom next summer. They can calculate a total maximum daily load of nutrients that Lake Erie can receive and come up with best management practices to reduce that nutrient runoff. Now, some of these practices require changes to the farm. For example, implementing cover crops or creating filter strips or wetlands at the edge of one's field to reduce that flow of nutrients. This also requires new equipment, like equipment that places fertilizer below the surface of the soil rather than broadcasting it on top. To encourage as much widespread adoption of these practices, the government has created policies that incentivize or assist farmers in adopting conservation. Last year, the USDA Farm Bill spent $4 billion on conservation agriculture. Some of this money goes to providing payments for farmers who retire some of their land for conservation, or offsetting the cost of new equipment. Some of this money also goes to funding agency staff who can provide technical assistance to farmers. Are these incentives enough at getting farmers to reduce their nutrient runoff? My sophomore year at Ohio State, I joined a team of scientists investigating the impact of these investments across four watersheds in the Midwest. We not only wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of these programs, but we wanted to find areas of improvement for future investments. This project addresses an issue that is applicable to so many of our environmental problems. Because we have the technical fix to nutrient runoff, 
but what we're missing is the connection between the solution and the people who need to make it happen. We know what to do about the meteor. We just haven't quite figured out how to get people to jump. Now we could force people to jump. We could pass blanket regulation that forces all farmers to adopt these practices, but this would be extremely difficult for small family farms who can't afford the new equipment or the risk of changing their practices. And we understand that farmers are more likely to continue conservation into the future if it is voluntary versus after regulation is lifted. So we're going to try everything we can to make nuanced voluntary programs that recognize the differences across diverse operations. The work that my advisor, Dr. Robin Wilson and I do focuses on farmers and their fields. What are their unique motivations to enrolling in these programs? Is it the monetary incentive or do they find these practices beneficial to their soil health? And what are their barriers to participating? Is it the lack of flexibility to manage their farm? Perhaps you're a small family farmer and farming isn't your only job, so you don't have the time or resources to enroll in programs with complex requirements and too much paperwork. We ask these questions to farmers and we listen to what they have to say. I examined years of survey data trying to answer these questions. And when that wasn't enough, I sent out a survey to 3,500 farmers across Wisconsin, New York, Michigan, and Ohio, asking them about their farms and their views towards these policies. And I know what you may be thinking. It's not possible to ask every farmer what they need and then create a program perfect for them. But what we can do with this $4 billion a year is fund the boots on the ground workers who can reach individual farmers, townships, counties, and grow the conservation movement from the local level up. We could fund more conservation professionals who can speak to farmers and their neighbors and come up with solutions. For example, purchasing shared equipment so farms don't have to face these costs individually. We could fund more edge of field monitoring so farmers can see how much nutrient loss is occurring on their field and have decision support tools. When we provide resources at the local level, then communities can ask the right questions and engage in conservation that works for them. One community becomes two, becomes a region reducing runoff into the Great Lakes. We face so many meteors right now and I know how overwhelming it can be to wonder how are we all going to jump? But remember that we have rooms of scientists here at Ohio State and in all of our communities finding innovative solutions. And we know from what's happening now, we have people that when asked can do seemingly impossible things together. When we engage people with technical solution making, then we can jump or leap or stomp or whatever it's going to take to move the planet.